Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to give uh, everybody like another minute here to, to join in, uh, then we'll get started. All right, let's get this thing rolling here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Trade Alley webinar, Errol Seal, Seal Commercial Duck Sealing. Uh, agenda today would be program reminders, custom rebate, and uh, we'll hand it off to Ryan Hogan from TEC for the Errol Seal Commercial Duck Sealing presentation. Important days, preparing to close out the program year this year, 2022. Avoid delays in payment. Please submit by the following. Uh, you can get us everything by tomorrow for the custom project. Would be great. And Friday, December 16th for any prescriptive projects. Uh, we, we do understand if it does run a little late on certain projects, we get it, we'll work with you. Just let us know ahead of time if you could. Um, if you haven't submitted for pre-approval, should be submitted sooner to avoid delay of payments. What I'm just trying to say, just keep us in the loop. Uh, if you got concerns about being late, just let us know so we can work with you. Uh, small and mid-side business bonus uh, was, was going on from Ox October 17th through tomorrow. Uh, you can see the different uh, process team traps for you, 488 each, 263, 225. Uh, this ends tomorrow, so I'm just gonna kind of blow through this. Uh, 2023 trade dialogue webinars. We got emerging technologies um, on January 25th. And then the second week of January, we're not sure the exact date yet, we will be going over the new 2023 uh, program updates. Uh, we'll get that out to you guys' webinar also, which should be an email out. Reminder space heating steam trap testing. Seasonal space heating steam traps, regardless of pressure. We only be tested during the heating season, September 15th through March 31st, and when outside temperature is 50 degrees or less. Testing of space heating steam traps outside of the designated heating season will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis and requires pre-approval. So like I said before, just get us involved, let us know, just stay in contact with us so we know what's going on. Steam traps that are not in service are not eligible for steam trap rebates. Boiler furnace uh, tune-ups. Got uh, customers are eligible for boiler and furnace tune-up rebates once every 36 months. A single unit with multiple burners or modules is considered one unit. Uh, the combustion efficiency of the unit must be tested pre and post tune-up, and an increase in efficiency must be shown. So we got to see some kind of increase, even if it's a 0.1. We got to see some kind of increase for the, the rebate for that boiler to be uh, the tune-up to be eligible for a rebate. Well, the tuna rebates are capped at 30 cents per MBH input, up to 1,000 on space heating boilers and 2,000 on process boilers, or 100% of the project cost, whichever is lower. If the boilers make a model and input capacity cannot be validated, your rebate may be capped at $250 per boiler. Here's your boiler tune-up checklist. If you don't have it, we have it on the uh, Trade Ally website. Uh, also, you can get a hold of me and I can send it out to you if you don't have it. It's just a signed program application. You need a tune up checklist, pre and post combustion, and an invoice to the customer. If the rebate is going to you, the contractor, you need to show it on the invoice that you subtracted, uh, subtracted the amount uh, to the customer off of their invoice. 2022 prescriptive program tune ups. Uh, you can see space heating boiler tune up. 30 cents per MBH, and that's greater than or equal to 100 MBH input. Process heating boiler tune-up rated for greater than 300 uh, MBH input. 
uh, like you said before, an increase in efficiency must be shown as 50 cents per MBH input, and a biz business furnace and rooftop uh, unit tune-up rated at greater than or equal to 60 MBH input, an increase in efficiency again must be shown. That is also at 30 cents per MBH. A public sector program tune-up, so you can see space heating uh, is at 75 cents per MBH, so a little more money on the, on the uh, public side. And the process boilers are at a dollar per MBH. Space heating boiler furnace tune-ups are capped at 1,500, and the process boilers are 2,500. You can see it's a little more than uh, than the regular uh, private sector. Custom program. If you're not aware of what the custom program is, you don't see it on the prescriptive. It has to go custom. Uh, custom rebates are only made available to help influence implement projects that are otherwise would not be completed. So the custom program. You got to get us involved early on when you're in the bidding process before you get a PO or order equipment. Um, we have to have an itemized statement, a project summary, and the original equipment manufacturer uh, OEM spec sheets. Get that to us, and then we will get you a rebate letter uh, with your rebate dollar amount that secures that money. They do not have to do the work, but this is what you have to do uh, to see if they want to move forward with the work and get a rebate. Like I said, it has to show influence in the in the project, unlike the prescriptive, where you can do the work and then uh, submit the rebate and you get the money. And like I said, you get obtain pre-approval. Once you get pre-approval, you can go ahead and uh, go ahead and start to work. Uh, here's the calculation on the rebates. Um, it's the lesser of buy down to one year payback, 75 cents per term saved annual on project 75,000 terms or less. And you get a dollar per therm saved annually on project with 7,500 therms or more. Full incremental project cost or 50% of the total project cost. So you can go up to 50% of the uh, project cost. Commercial duct sealing and testing by Ryan Holger from TEC. Uh, this is me. If you have any questions, uh, who are you going to call? Just call me. You can call me on my cell as the easiest at 630 742 4669 or my email. If you have a project you're looking at, you need information or need help, uh, you want one of our energy advisors to help you out, uh, just shoot me an email with all the info and I'll get in contact with the right guy or girl and they'll get you taken care of. Gmaxim at franklinenergy.com. And now, as you can see, oh, down at the bottom, the rebate application, everything else. If you guys haven't been there yet, um, I know I've been shoving this down your throat a lot. People's Gas, North Shore Gas, Trade has everything you need on there, except for me. And Kate, he was on the line, and, and Ryan. So just get a hold of me by email or phone. Uh, if you want to take a look at people's gas, North Shore Gas Trade that'd be great. There's a lot of good information on there. And now I will turn it over to Ryan Hoger, TEC. I can figure out how to do that. Uh, it should be good, I think. Should you got it? Do you see my screen? I do, yeah. All right. So we good to go? Excellent. Yeah, it looks All right, good. I'll be quiet. Thanks. <laughs> no, you're good, man. All right. Well, thank you for having me back. Uh, I love doing these for People's Gas and North Shore Gas. Can't forget the other side of the fence. Uh, it's been a couple years since we've done this particular topic, so figured it was kind of time to do it again. Make sure everybody's up to speed. There are a couple minor things that are different regarding newer codes, um, but fundamentally, you know, things are still the same. Uh, so we're going to focus on duct sealing, specifically from the commercial standpoint. We'll talk about it generically, and then as Glenn said, we'll also talk about how Aerial Seal is a solution to the duct sealing requirements, uh, or not even just requirements. Sometimes you just want to do it retroactively uh, just to save some cash, uh, save some energy. Obviously, if you're leaking air into the wrong places, uh, that can can waste energy. Uh, a big portion of this, commercially speaking for commercial buildings, is the fan energy. Uh, there is a ton of fan energy used in buildings. We spend more energy on running fans and pumps and stuff like that to, to move energy around the building than we do actually making the cold air or cold water. Uh, so fan energy is huge and anything we can do to reduce fan energy will have a giant, ginormous impact. Uh, making you know systems more efficient in general from a gas usage and electrical usage standpoint is great, uh, but the fan energy is kind of key there too. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is accept the fact that most duct systems currently suck, suck really bad um, or blow really bad, depending on how you want to look at that, I guess. 
uh, puns all intended. Uh, duck leakage is horrible, both residentially and commercially. It is completely normal for ducks to leak 20, 30, 35%, and nobody even bats an eye. It's just kind of accepted that air is going to be leaking all over the place. But when it leaks in walls and shafts and building cavities and above the ceiling grid, that's air, warm air or cold air that was not delivered to the actual space, which means your system has to run more to get the air you need into the space. So we're going to see all this stuff up. Uh, and obviously save a boatload of energy in the process. Uh, this is just showing you some examples here for those that are familiar with uh, some of the specifications associated with duct leakage. Uh, a really common specification listed here as we're showing is a 200. Uh, what that actually means is an example with a 10,000 CFM air handler at one and a half inches of static, uh, you're allowed to have 3,100 CFM of leakage and that's fine, that accept, that's acceptable. Um, that's a third of your air, obviously, or almost a third of your air. So what we're recommending is that you look for class A, which is currently a code requirement, but old buildings obviously are what they are. A new building, it's class A. Uh, that's a class, class leakage of four, which is only 62 CFM on that 10,000 CFM air handler. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty ginormous difference. Obviously, on new construction, if you follow code, if you follow the codes, uh, you will have a pretty good duct system. But there's a lot of existing buildings out there that are just built the way they were built, you know, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, whatever it was. So we really want to focus on those buildings, uh, the buildings that are already out there doing their thing and doing it poorly. Um, so as mentioned, these systems are pretty leaky. A couple examples uh, and, this, and the citations are down below. Uh, but VAV systems, which are very common systems for commercial buildings, 20 to 35 percent duct leakage. 25-30% uh, more fan energy uh, is being used on these leaky duct systems than one that would be a code compliant tight system. Uh, exhaust fan shafts are really bad uh, and everybody's like, oh, who cares? It's just being exhausted out anyway. Yeah, except for when the exhaust has odors and other things going on in it and now it's leaking back into the building. Uh, not to mention you have to buy a bigger exhaust fan and run a bigger exhaust fan to get the air that you want out if you're actually going to balance the system. For those that don't like numbers and metrics, we got a couple of visuals on here. Uh, so you can kind of see this is an infrared thermal camera on the left. I believe this photo was courtesy of Airway Systems. Uh, so I got to thank the people that I literally steal from. Um, but you can see here the temperature differences with the thermal camera and where these two ducts connect. In this case, it's two flex ducts running off to diffusers. So commercial buildings, we don't typically use flex duct except for that four or five foot distance uh, from the main duct over to the diffuser. Uh, and you can see here when things aren't connected properly, which is very frequently the case, uh, you'll end up with duct leakage. The flex duct itself doesn't typically leak, uh, nor does sheet metal duct. It's all the connection points. That's always the problem uh, where things are connected in the field together. They're not tight. And you can see the gap here where I got warm air leaking out of this thing. Uh, this is just showing you, I should probably blown this up a little bit bigger, uh, showing you one of the federal studies uh, on some of the technologies that can be utilized to save the most energy on existing buildings. And we specifically highlighted number two, number six, and number eight, because those were the top HVAC things. The other stuff on the list wasn't HVAC. And I only care about HVAC, so I only have that on here. Uh, as Ben was just talking about on the intro slides, uh, condensing boilers, upgrading to a boiler and getting your boiler working efficiently is on that list. It's one of the biggest things you can do. Uh, for a large commercial building. Ground source heat pumps is on the list. That's a fantastic technology, but it is not one that you can easily retrofit. So it's kind of off the table on existing buildings. I mean, it's not technically you could do it, but to dig all the fields up and put wells in is pretty rough. And then number eight on the list, the, the, the number third HVAC thing on the list is, uh, is duct sealing. Um, and specifically mentioning aerosol-based duct sealing, which is aeroseal. Uh, as the solution there. And it tells you on the side here as a country, how many, you know, quads of energy we can save and all that great stuff. Uh, so typical applications for duct sealing uh, needs uh, on exhaust systems. If we have duct sealing completed on those type of systems, whether it's aeroseal or whether it's done by hand, uh, you can reduce the fan horsepower of that fan, basically put a smaller fan in or slow your existing fan down, and you can reduce your infiltration load uh, on the building. And then on air handlers and package units, we're showing those separate. I mean, they really are kind of the same thing. It's just that the benefits are different based on where things are located sometimes. Um, but 
for either one of these guys, you will be able to reduce uh, your uh, fan related heating load. Um, you'll be able to reduce the fresh air load uh, and you'll obviously reduce heating and cooling loads. So to give you some visuals on that, in this case, we're showing a package rooftop unit. Let me see if I can get the John Madden laser pointer thing going here. Uh, so I have outside air coming into my rooftop. I have return air coming back into my rooftop. And then I have my supply duct running down, in this case, through a uh, dropped uh, acoustical type ceiling. Uh, I have air leakage that comes into play here. So these are my ducts that I'm actually trying to move air out of. But in regards to the air leakage, See if the little arrows pop up for me, right? All the air that's leaking out of my ducts in the ceiling cavity is actually leaking out of the building in most cases. If I have ductwork in the space and it leaks, it's like, oh, okay, you got leaky ductwork in your space, at least it still gets to the space. But when it leaks in ceiling cavities, walls, shafts, some of that might go back to the space, some of it goes directly to the outdoors. Um, low pressure uh, leakage, short circuit runs on a duct system. This is constant volume systems. We'll do VAV in a second. Uh, it takes longer to make temperature. If I'm losing some of my air, it's not getting into the space. I have to run my system more than I wanted to run it in order to achieve the desired heating or cooling set point in the space. It requires me to run my fan more than I wanted to. Uh, it means I have more fan heat waste added into my duct system. Um, lots of negatives to this duct leakage. On VAV systems, we kind of divide the problem in two halves. For those of you that are familiar with VAV, you probably know that upstream of the VAV terminal, the dampers, the zone dampers, upstream is typically a medium pressure duct system, and downstream is a lower pressure duct system. Duct leakage penalties are larger the higher the pressure you operate at is, right? Because then a small hole can have a giant amount of leakage, CFM-wise, because uh, the pressure pushing it out the hole is more. So sealing duct systems upstream of the VAV box is significantly more important than sealing them downstream of the VAV box. Should you seal downstream? Yes, you should do that. But if your budget doesn't afford that, or if the downstream sections are inaccessible, at least seal up all the main duct runs uh, and you'll have an improved system. And then as I mentioned with exhaust systems too, if you have duct leaking, duct leakage there, this is a really tiny duct on this drum, so it's kind of crappy. Uh, but most duct systems have much longer uh, runs for exhaust shafts. This one's only like seven feet long. Um, but that that leakage duct out there does change the pressure relationship with the building. It does cause air to leak into those spaces sometimes if I have my leaky duct work, right? So I'm supposed to be sucking a certain amount of CFM up this duct and out this fan. And this fan's moving whatever. Say it's moving 5,000 CFM. It may only be getting 3,000 from the space and 2,000 might be coming from the leakage of the shafts, which puts this whole shaft, the ceiling cavity under a negative, which means somewhere else air is leaking in to take care of that. So I have quite a few penalties there. For you guys that follow code, uh, this is straight out of the IECC 2021 code book. For the purposes of duct sealing, it is identical to the 2018. So if you know in Illinois, we are following the 2018 IECC statewide. So people in the North Shore territory, you have to follow that. In the city of Chicago, which would be the People's Gas Territory, as of November 1st, we are now following the 2021. As far as duct sealing goes though, it's the exact same, nothing has changed. A little pro tip on reading the code book, because I know you guys love reading code books. Uh, if you have the PDF version of the code book, these black lines on the side of the book are not random. Those tell you that something in that particular section right there has changed from the last version, which is the 2018. So something here specifically changed. In this case, it was just a verbiage description, nothing that affected us. For us, the duct sealing stuff is down here at the bottom and nothing has changed. Ducts, air handlers, and filter boxes shall be sealed. Joints and seams shall comply with the IMC, International Mechanical Code. So the energy code is telling you you have to seal these things up. They're not telling you how to do it or what level of sealing. They're directing you over to another book that you must acquire and put into your library. Uh, that mechanical code book looks like this. Um, this is the section specifically related to joint seams and connections, right? So this reference down here drove me over to this particular book. Um, and basically it's telling you, yeah, you got to seal all that stuff up. Okay, no brainer there, right? I can read that part, but you got to seal everything. It used to be like you'd seal certain parts of stuff. At this point, the code book is just seal everything, everything. Joints, yes. Longitudinal and traverse seams, yes. Uh, fasteners, yes. 
You can seal it by welding it. You're not gonna do that. That's too expensive for most projects. You can gasket it. Sometimes you might do that. You can use mastic. You can use adhesives, which are basically mastics. You can have fabric mastics. You can do liquid sealants, which would be aero seal. And you can even do tape. Tape is allowed. There is some confusion on that. People will say, oh no, you can't use tape. When we say you can't use tape, we mean you can't use crappy tape. You can't use actual duct tape. By the way, duct tape can be used everywhere for everything in your life except duct work. It doesn't go on duct work. It's for everything else. Um, and you can't even use the low end foil tape. You have to use UL 181 listed tape if you wanna go the tape route. Um, but you can in fact use it. Then down at the bottom here, when you get to ducts that have higher pressures, then you're gonna get some more requirements that kick in as far as that goes. But that's pretty high pressure. Uh, the energy code, still continuing on with that. There's low, medium and high pressure systems. Low pressure systems means less than two inches of static. And then specifically, they're telling you you got to seal the longitude and traverse seams and connections. When you get up to medium pressure systems, that's two to three inches. And they're basically telling you you have to seal everything. And then when you get up, so the takeaway on that is low pressure systems, you got to seal it. Um, medium pressure, you have to seal it and insulate it. I should have mentioned that as well. And then when you get to high pressure systems, which is three inches and up, which is not a lot of systems these days, you not only have to seal it, but then you have to leak test it to prove you did a good job. Basically, we don't trust you, prove that you did a good job. So low pressure systems and medium, you just have to seal it. High pressure systems, you have to seal it and test it out. Um, because of that, people are being smarter and they're designing for things less than three inches, so they don't have to do this testing process. But once in a while, you have products where you have to do it. Um, and then if you look at the, I should do this in reverse, but if you look at the ASHRAE standards, which is what the mechanical codes and, and uh, energy codes feed off of, everything has to be seal class A. It used to not be that way. Sometimes it would say you do B or C. Now it's all A. So basically, you don't even need the language anymore. Get rid of the language. Do everything in A. So seal everything. Every kind of duct system, seal it, seal it, seal it, seal it up. There's no, no exceptions. Oh, it's only return duct. Still got to seal it. Exhaust duct, still got to seal it. You got to seal everything at this point. And by the way, for the guys who do residential, it's the same deal. You got to seal all your duct work now. There's no duct work in any space that no longer has to be sealed by codes. Once again, though, existing buildings, you got plenty of unsealed duct work out there. Most buildings. We keep moving here in the just interest of time. I'll skip that. All right. If you're going to are going to do the duct testing on a commercial system, what that essentially means is you're going to bring in a portable fan of some sort, like this gentleman has here uh, that has a speed control on it. And you're going to put airflow monitoring stations on there. You're going to suck air from the room and shove it into the ductwork while you simultaneously have taped off all the ductwork. I know my pictures here are a little more residential-ish, but or one's a lab actually, and one looks more like it's residential. But you're going to tape off all of the ducts, all the diffusers, so air cannot come out the diffusers. If I close off all the diffusers, and then I make a hole in the duct, and I run this fan to inject air into it, if I am able to move air into that duct system, that means air is moving out of the duct system somewhere. And if I can measure how much air I shove into the duct, I will then know how much air is coming out of the duct. Because it'd be very hard to measure all the little tiny gaps and leaks. Like you have to go around the building somehow and, and quantify them. But we don't have to do that. If I inject all the air in at one singular, singular point, I can just measure how much air I'm injecting in. And that is in fact how much air I am leaking out. If you're savvy about it, especially if you're trying to solve the problem as opposed to pass a test, uh, you'll use a smoke generator, kind of one of those theatrical ones that it's basically an electrical box and it, it is smoke into the air, you know, for theaters and stuff like that. You can put that right here on the ground next to the inlet of the fan and it'll suck that theatrical smoke in and then you'll be able to see where it's leaking out in the building and hence you know where you got to go make your duct repairs. If anybody has any questions uh, in the chat box there, uh, Glenn, just, just yell at me and I'll try to answer them. Um, okay, so, and then you're gonna get some kind of report, looks something like this-ish, uh, depending on what kind of manometer and machine you're using, that tells you how much leakage you have at what pressure testing. All right, so then you decide to make, make some improvements. You're gonna seal the duct, either because it's a new job and you have to do it by code, or because it's an existing job and you just want to make improvements to save energy, improve air quality. I didn't even mention that. If you're sucking air in from all the wrong places on the return duct, right? Basements, crawl spaces, uh, attic cavities, wall shafts, uh, dirty areas, 
if you return duct is leaky, you suck that crap in and then you distribute that crap everywhere else. Crap is a technical term. Um, so you decide to make this the ceiling improvement happen. These are the ways you can do it. You can use the UL listed tape, right? That's easy. Pretty much anybody can do that. Um, the challenge there is getting to all the places, physically getting there uh, to all the places that have the duct leakage. Some spots it's easy, some spots it's pretty hard. You can use mastic, right? And mastic is applied uh, by hand. I'll show you a picture of that real quick. So up here in the top right, this is mastic. Um, you can do it with a brush. Some guys will do that or with a, uh, you know, a, a, like a spackling type tool. Uh, but doing it with the glove is actually kind of the easiest way to do it. Because when you're using the, the mastic, you don't just want to take it like we did in the bottom drawing here and just like paint it straight down. Uh, all that does is it just kind of puts a layer of goop on each side of the duct. But I need the goop in the middle in the cracks. So by using it with a glove, you can use your fingers to actually work the mastic into the cracks. That is the preferred way to do it. And that's gonna give you the most likely chance of passing a duct leakage test. Uh, but you can use mastic. You can weld the duct, right? That's not very common. Most people are not gonna weld ducts. Uh, a regular office building or a school, you're not doing that. But if you had like a laboratory or something like that, and you really could not have any possible leakage on the exhaust side of the system, because whatever you're exhausting out is hazardous, then maybe perhaps you would choose to weld the duct work. You can gasket it. I think I had a picture of that. I didn't. Uh, you can gasket it, but that means you're gonna take the two pieces of duct and they're gonna fit like this together. And you're gonna put gasketing material on that flange. And then when you put it together, you're gonna screw them together and that gasket's gonna compress and that's gonna be your seal. And then you can aero seal it. Um, Obviously, the gasketing, you have to do it as you're installing the ductwork. The welding, you pretty much have to do as you're installing the ductwork. Tape and mastic, you can do or will do after the ductwork is hung or existing. It's just hard to get back to that stuff. Aero seal, you will always do after the ductwork is installed. Uh, and it's the easiest one to do after the ductwork is installed because you never have to get back to the ductwork that's buried. It's in a wall cavity and you can't get to it. You don't have to bust the wall open. That's totally fine. We can seal it without getting to it because the aero seal process is going to seal it from the inside out. Uh, I say we can do it. I'm not the one doing it. I don't, I don't work for aero seal. I just like the technology. So I pay attention to it. I teach classes on it, but it's not like I work there. Um, but they gave me this nice polo to wear for today. So that was pretty cool. Um, all right, so the aero seal process, um, this is what it's gonna look like. So this is a pretty simple, small duct system for our example right here. So here's my duct system. Here's my main supply trunk. Number three is my air handling unit. It doesn't matter if it's a rooftop unit, an air handler, a fan coil, a residential furnace, whatever you got. On uh, This number one side over here is my return side. And over here is my supply side of duct work. What we are going to do is we are going to cap off with a foam block. Looks like this. Um, so this guy has cut a foam block. In this case, it's a residential picture, but same idea. Uh, to fit into that register, Commercially, we do the same thing. We take the diffuser down, cut a foam block, stick it up in the diffuser. The reason we use the foam blocks instead of just using the tape like we did for the test is that duct sealing test is done at typically pretty low pressure. Um, 50 pascals, 25 pascals is the standard for residential. 25 pascals is 0.1 inches of static. It's a pretty low pressure test. When we seal the ductwork with aero seal, we're going to start low and we're going to keep ramping it up as the ductwork seals and we're going to finish at two two and a half inches of pressure uh, that we're pushing into that duct system with the aero seal equipment so if we put just tape on the on the diffusers it would blow right off or eventually it would blow right off as the duct system got tighter and tighter so you put these foam blocks in and let's say you had uh like this guy here probably had <clears throat> excuse me probably isn't uh has a uh, a four by uh four by eight register four by ten register let's say We'll cut the foam block four and a half by 10 and a half inches, a little bit bigger. So you really have to jam it down in there. And then the pressure of the diffuser, or in this case, the, the, the boot is going to compress that foam. So really it can't go anywhere. So we're going to block off all these intentional diffusers because we don't want to seal those shut because that would be stupid because we want actually air to move through there someday. So we're going to seal off all the intentional openings and then we're going to cut a hole in the duct somewhere and we're going to connect this bag to it. And that bag is connected to a fan system. And we're gonna suck air in from the building space into that fan system through this bag and pressurize this duct. Exact same thing we were doing with that duct leakage test earlier. The only thing that's going to be different other than the foam blocks versus tape 
is that we are going to put in this injection machine here in line with it. This is a wand. Um, it is going to bring in compressed air and it's going to bring in liquid glue and it's going to mix those two and create an aerosol for us. So not only are we blowing air down this duct system to see where it leaks out, but we're blowing down a glue-based aerosol down the same duct system. And then when it leaks out of the duct, it'll move from high pressure inside the duct to low pressure outside the duct. So its velocity will slow down significantly. And those little glue balls in the air will adhere to the edge of the crack. And then the next glue ball behind him will stick to him and then to him and then to him. And essentially it scabs the cracks closed. It is very much like getting a cut on your hand. And you, this is so gross, I know, I get it. Uh, but you see the scab like closing up over the course of the day from the outside inward and it closes up. The same thing is gonna happen here. The glue is gonna build up on the outside of the crack and then it's gonna close up. Uh, the aeroseal process can effectively seal about a five eighths inch gap. It could do something slightly larger than that, but it takes a long, long time and it's not practical. But you got little gaps and little cracks up to a five eighths, which is actually is pretty big. Five eighths is way bigger than a duct leak you should have. Uh, it'll seal those, those great gaps up. Uh, not only are we also, I should mention this, not only are we blocking the diffusers, we're blocking off other stuff. So in this case, it was some kind of fan coil in here. So we didn't want glue from the sealing process, right? So up here, we're gonna inject in the main supply trunk uh, and it'll go down the duct, but it's also gonna go backwards towards the air handler because it doesn't know any better. Uh, so we cut a hole in there and we put a foam block above the air handler so we don't send glue down into the evaporator coil or into the gas heating section or anything like that. This whole process is driven off of a laptop or a, la uh, a tablet. Um, this is an older computer picture, but uh, same idea. Uh, so that equipment, the manometer inside there, the fan system, the glue injection system are all hooked up to a microprocessor and that is controlled directly from a laptop. We start doing more larger commercial applications. Sometimes we will have to use two fan boxes uh, like they were using on this particular project. I believe this was an airway systems job too. Um, but one fan wasn't big enough because the duct system was pretty large. So in order to generate enough pressure, they twin two fan boxes together. So they got more airflow moving through here. And then we still have that injection wand assembly here. Somebody's tracking that with a laptop as it's happening in real time. And then you start seeing the glue build up on all the various cracks in corners, along edges and so forth. I don't know how well you guys can see this pick, uh, but there was a crack there beforehand. And then afterwards, you can see that got sealed up as did a little bit along this ridge right here. So the, the technician is watching this on their computer happening. They're seeing the leakage rate in real time. It's constantly calculating every minute and they're seeing it drop down and down and down. And they keep going until they either get to the leakage rate that is required by whatever specification they're trying to meet or until things kind of flatline. And it's like, OK, we've gotten down to the, the practical point here. I can't chase the last 8, 12, 50 CFM. Uh, I'm kind of at a practical conclusion. Uh, as far as the sealant itself goes, uh, it is a vinyl acetate polymer. I had no idea what that meant 10 years ago. That was just another you know, word to me. Um, but it's used, that material is used in lots of different things, including baby binkies, like little pacifiers. They use that material in there, chewing gum, stuff like that. So it is a pretty common material. Uh, obviously, it's a slightly different blend, so we can make it into an aerosol based, uh, but it's not like it's some weird foreign chemical that you should be totally freaked out about. Uh, it is a normal everyday chemical in your life. Uh, paints use it and stuff like that, and it is a relatively low VOC content. The product life, uh, just sitting in a jug on a shelf, it's like a two year life because it starts settling out. But once you turn it into an aerosol and mix it with uh, compressed air and, and put it into the duct system, at that point, you then have a 30-year uh, a uh, life expectancy on the material. And you also get, commercially, you get a three-year guarantee on that. So that we, if you have any duct leakage that shows up in the first three years, then somebody is going to be coming back out there to seal it back up for you. Once again, not me, somebody else. Um, it has UL 1381 uh, rating. That is for flame spread. So you can use it on duct material. So it is, a, it is, a, it is, a, it is, a, uh, it is an approved material to use on uh, HVAC duct systems. I'm gonna see if this little video thing plays for me here. Let me turn off the laser pointer, use my mouse. All right, this little animation that kind of describes what I was telling you. So we're bl blowing that aerosol-based glue down in the duct system. 
These little tiny glue balls, like I was calling them, are moving down the duct. When they come up to a crack, they go from high pressure in the duct to low pressure outside the duct, and it starts scabbing that hole closed. And then they're available. Whatever's coming down the duct now no longer wastes time there. It spends more time moving down the duct to the next crack that it finds. And there's just thousands of these cracks all over, and it's just constantly moving down the duct system. Then after you're done, we do another test. So we have a pre-test to see what our leakage is, just like any duct sealing process should have. Then we're watching the duct leakage in real time. And then there's a post-test. So you're done sealing, you've concluded the project, no more sealings needed. We do a post-test to see how good we did. And then with that pre and that post-test, you can decide how, how much reduction you've had in leakage. Because you're testing those two things at the same pressure. And then you take everything out, remove all the foam blocks that you put in, uh, and then the access hole you made for the foam block and the injection hole, uh, you will have to then manually seal those up by putting a piece of sheet metal there and then taping or masticking that piece. The consumer, the building owner, is going to get a report similar to this. Uh, my screenshot here is a little older looking version of the report, um, but it's still the same kind of data you get on there. Uh, so you can see on that report, or the customer can see on that report, that's uh, too small, bigger laser pointer. Uh, what the initial leakage rate was graphically and as it dropped over time. And I don't have my glasses on because I'm an old person now. Uh, so that's going over the course of about 55 minutes it took to seal this duct system down from an initial leakage rate of 3,300 CFM down to 178 CFM. So that was a 95% reduction in leakage. You're saving 3,000 CFM of duct leakage at this point. Um, it only took 50 some minutes. Someone would have been doing this there all day though, because it's gonna take them a couple hours to get everything set up and close off all these registers and diffusers. And then it takes a couple hours to clean everything up. So it is an all day project for even a system that's this small, um, but the actual ceiling time is under an hour, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. So a 95% reduction in the leakage rate, um, the initial leakage of 3,300 at that pressure was equivalent to a 124 inch hole. Now there wasn't one big 124 inch hole, it was a bunch of little tiny holes that added up to that. But then when all is said and done, there's a seven inch equivalent hole. Once again, it's not a seven inch hole. It's a bunch of little holes that add up to that. Uh, and usually when you show this report to the end user, they're like, well, how do we seal up those last, that last seven inches? Where is, it, where is it at? It's like, dude, it's really small. It's a bunch of pinholes. You're probably not gonna get it. Uh, but this is still a fantastic improvement. That's 3000 CFM that's now going to where it's supposed to go. Um, so advantages of this technology over doing it by hand, uh, such as mastic, mainly I'm comparing it to mastic because if you're in the case of like welding and stuff like that, you're in a whole different category of building uh, and, and specific, you know, specialty project. But mastic would be the common method for commercial buildings uh, and even residential. Uh, so the advantage of the aero seal really is that you're sealing it from the inside out, which means you don't have to physically get to the ductwork. It can be behind drywall and paneling and and shafts and ceiling and, and all that stuff you don't have to get there you just have to get somewhere where you can make one injection point on the duct and after that you can do it all from the inside out that's the real advantage of it yes it will seal down to a lower leakage rate than doing it by hand even if you're really good at doing it by hand people always miss stuff right that human element you just don't get to everything or you get to three sides of the duct and you can't get to the four side because the four side is literally pushed up against the a ceiling joist or something like that, and you physically can't get there, it's impossible. So you do get a lower leakage rate because you can get to everything. All right, for those that are not familiar with this technology, uh, aerial seal is not new. It may sound new, today may be the first time you heard about it, but it's not new. Uh, this has been around a long time. Uh, so I actually started in this industry in 1997, and it already existed before then. Um, it wasn't a product before then, but it existed. So this is actually a technology that was not developed in the uh, you know, public world. It was developed, um, or excuse me, the private world. It was developed in the public world by Lawrence Berkeley Labs out in California, it's a national uh, United States laboratory. They invented it. A guy named Dr. Mudera is the one that created this technology. Uh, and they got the pet, he has the patent for it still. <clears throat> and then in 1997, a company called AeroSeal was founded and granted the rights to the patent so it could be commercialized and hence put into, into projects. That's pretty normal. Usually uh, lab type research facilities don't have the ability to start businesses and run them. Um, so they eventually just license their patent out to somebody and let them do that part of it. So AeroSeal has been around 25 years now. 
uh, mainly doing residential stuff. Um, they're currently owned by a company called a JMD. They were owned by Carrier for a while, like nine years. Um, but and that's how my company got involved in it because we do a lot of Carrier stuff. Um, but commercially, which is our focus today, they started doing that in 2004. So we are 18 years into into uh, Aeroseal having uh, having commercial projects under their belt. Um, and it's really been fairly common since about 2015 in the Chicagoland area. Prior to that, we weren't doing any projects around here. They were being done in projects where energy costs were were higher and stuff like that. I think all kinds of awards and all that wonderful stuff too, which I'm not good at hyping that up. As far as local projects go, uh, this is the first one that we did uh, at our company. Uh, once again, we don't we don't do the work. We just kind of played matchmaker. So if you didn't know, we do all kinds of HVAC equipment distribution, chillers and air handlers and, and makeup air units and boilers and all that kind of stuff. Um, but sometimes there's technologies that really kind of help our systems work better, like AeroSeal. So we promote those technologies and try to get people to do them. Our air handlers do a better job of cooling your building if the air is not leaking all over the place, that kind of idea. Uh, so we didn't physically do this work, but we, we like to get involved in these projects because we're doing other parts of the project anyway. In this case, it was the Wrigley Building. It was a small one, very small, only four, only 430 CFM leakage. This doesn't, that doesn't mean it's good, right? Uh, just relatively speaking, compared to some of the other jobs I show you. But it's a high-profile building. People recognize it, obviously, so we, we mention it. Uh, and it was the first one that, that was be, really being done uh, in recent times in the Chicagoland area. Um, you can see the graph and showing the reduction on that guy, down to 31 CFM leakage. Uh, here's a university library. Uh, similar small type, small project, early early job. Uh, this was just for some specific spaces in the library, so it was a fairly small system. But still, they had 600 CFM and leakage, got it down to 17, which is really, really low. Uh, it's basically almost immeasurable. This job, this is my favorite. Um, this is now six years ago that, um, that uh, one of the guys did this job. Uh, but it was a pretty big system. It's a 60,000 CFM air handler. Um, which, is, which is obviously large uh, in the Chicago Hilton Hotel. All the ductwork goes underneath the floors and it's inaccessible, which makes things hard, obviously. It's going under all like all the banquet spaces and that. Um, but initial leakage when tested was 12,000 CFM of leakage for this one air handler, which is obviously horrific. Um, it was so big that, that they couldn't use one aero seal machine to seal it all simultaneously. So they had to bust it up into different duct sections. So one of the guys made this little color-coded uh, a drawing for us to show how they broke up the different duct sections and sealed each one of these branches individually. Uh, that way they could generate enough pressure to do it. And then showed you the initial and post leakage of each branch. And you're getting between 94 and 99% reduction of leakage. And in total, it went from 12,000 CFM leakage down to 600 CFM, which was a 95% improvement. They literally have 12,000 CFM that used to be leaking under the floor being wasted that is now going into the spaces. So significant improvement in airflow in the spaces and obviously reduced energy costs uh, to go with that. Um, this uh, air handling system was like, it's like an 80 year old constant volume system that they converted over to VAV. Um, but the duct work, it is what it is. You couldn't really get back to it again. So this solution really worked really well. There's also a bunch of hospitals. A few of them I got a couple to show you on. Some of them we can't mention because some hospitals don't want us to mention anything because they don't want people to know the ductwork was leaking beforehand because that meant stuff from this patient area could be leaking into that patient area, which could mean germ spread. So they don't typically want people to know that, that they had those issues in the past. Um, and they probably didn't even know they had those issues until they finally tested it, right? And then they, then they fix it. Um, but hospitals are a big candidate for this because of that reason, germ spread. Uh, even prior to, to COVID stuff, it was a big candidate. Some hospitals do do want to stay anonymous, so this is just a generic hospital in this case. Other hospitals are cool with us mentioning their name, uh, but this one went down. This was uh, can't see twelve thousand CFM or twelve hundred CFM, excuse me, down to sixty four CFM of leakage when all was said and done. Another ninety five percent reduction in leakage. You can see the theme is ninety two, ninety four, ninety five, ninety six, ninety nine percent reduction in leakage all day long. Uh, this this hospital was okay with their name being out there um, because it was a, not an it was a newer duct system. Um, so initial leakage went from 4,800 down to 200. Here's another one. This was seven separate air handlers that added up to 21,000 CFM of leakage, got it down to under 900. 
for those seven systems combined, 96% uh, reduction, all right? Um, and there's just tons of examples like this. Uh, this one is not a hospital, but it's a retirement facility, 95% uh, reduction, um, 9,000 down to 500 CFM. You're saving 8,672 CFM of leaking air. It, I mean, and there's just example after example after example. Um, there's no shortage of, of cases. This is probably the worst example I have. It only only improved the duct leakage 90%, right? Well, what a, what a horrible project that one was. Um, so there's just tons of cases like that. Um, it is common to clean the ducts before you seal them. Um, you don't have to. You can have your dirty ducts sealed, um, but it's just kind of illogical. Like the dirt's getting in there through the leaks. You're finally going to seal them. Why not just get rid of all the crap? and then seal it. So most people will clean the ducts and then seal them, but you don't you don't technically have to do that. You can, I guess you can encapsulate, encapsulate the grossness in there forever if you want. Um, so clean and seal is a common uh, application strategy that, that many will do, um, but you don't have to do it that way. Uh, the, 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 the cost of duct cleaning and the cost of aerial seal are those two different things. When you do them together, there is some overlap. So you do save uh, installation cost, if you will, by doing them simultaneously, because um, you still have to get in access to some of these duct openings and things like that to hook up equipment. So you might as well just go ahead and clean it um, while you're doing it. Uh, sometimes I get the question, can you clean the ducts after you've aerial sealed them? You can do that. Um, not every kind of duct cleaning machine is approved for that, but some of them can do that. Uh, but it's kind of illogical to me. Like, why would you? Why would you just clean it first and get rid of all the crap? I don't understand. Um, but you could do it in reverse if you wanted to. All right, I'm just going to skip through. I think I had most of these, uh, most of these uh, case studies, but there I kept a few of them in there. That was a school one. Um, one of the things that happens is on some projects, especially like hospitals, you can't unoccupy the space to do this. That's okay. People don't have to necessarily leave while this ceiling activity is happening. Um, if you're there and you're present, um, a lot like at your house, let's say you had aerosol done at your house, uh, if you're gonna stick around while they're actually sealing it, we usually give you a mask, like a painter's mask or, or a surgical mask like you guys use. Well, not, not a surgical mask, that wouldn't really do it. A painter's mask, the ones that kind of go across your face, like you should have been wearing for COVID, but you didn't wear. Uh, you had a designer one instead, right? Uh, we put those on, not necessarily because this is you know super hazardous material or anything, it's just that, at least from my experience, on times I didn't wear the mask when I was doing sealing, I would breathe in and then basically the glue would start clogging up my nose. Like I would literally have little glue balls in my nose, which is super gross. So you just wear the painter's mask and you don't have to deal with it for the same reason why painters wear the painter's mask. Um, but for more critical applications like a hospital, you can't really just gut the hospital and tell everybody to leave. That doesn't really work. So they do stuff like they'll do sections at a time. And they'll seal off that section while they're doing that area of the building. They'll seal it off so things aren't leaking from one to the other. And they'll use negative air machines, which is nothing more than a fancy name for a fan that sucks air out of the room and ducks it over to somewhere else, preferably out of the building. The reason you do that is because when we're sealing this ductwork from the inside out, that glue ball, those glue balls are going down the duct, finding the crack, leaking out the crack, and sealing the crack as they go out. But some of them are going out. So they're going to end up in the room or in the rooms, plural. Um, if you're doing it above the ceiling, all the ductwork's above the ceiling, usually not a big deal. Most of it stays above the ceiling. But if you have exposed ductwork, then you start seeing more of that glue in the air coming down. So running these fans to suck that air out of the room and duct it out, or running a scrubber, which is nothing more than a, a cube, if you will, that has a fan on it, no duct, uh, but a bunch of filters on every side of it. So it sucks air in through high uh, efficiency, high mervid filters, to pull that glue out of the air. Um, so that way you don't have it moving all over the space. Um, this is kind of an old chart, probably from five, six years ago, showing you some of the high profile AeroSeal commercial clients. Um, since this time, there's been more and more of these added to the list um, because it is a pretty, uh, pretty common technology. A lot of universities, a lot of healthcare stuff. Um, and for the same reason, those places have longer term outlooks on things. Uh, to get a restaurant to do this, not likely. I mean, they could, but it's kind of like they don't even know if they're going to be in business a year from now, let alone want to make improvements that you know last 20, 30 years. Universities and hospitals, those places have long-term outlooks, uh, so they're willing to invest in technologies uh, for things that make their building you know last longer, or should say work better while they last longer. As mentioned, up to a five-eighths inch gap can be sealed. 
You do not have to take out dampers. Um, you, you can either seal through the dampers, um, which at my own personal house, I did this nine years ago at my house. Uh, right when I started getting ready to teach classes on it, I'm like, I got, I got to see how it works. Um, we're going to do it at my coworker's house, but then his wife said, no, nobody can come hang out at our house for the day. So we did it at my house. My wife was also not happy, but we did it anyway. Uh, but in any case, uh, I have his own damper system at home and I just drove all my dampers wide open and we just sealed right through those things. Um, but you can also isolate them with a VAV box. It's a little different than a residential damper. So typically we'll put a piece of foam blocking upstream of the VAV box and seal up the medium pressure ductwork. And then later on, if you're gonna do the whole duct system, we'll put a piece of foam blocking on the discharge side of your VAV boxes and seal up the low pressure side as two separate events. Um, but um, anything else in the space like pressure sensors, humidity sensors, things like that, um, duct sen temperature sensors, we'll pull those out of the duct put a piece of tape over them, a piece of like uh, foil tape over them, seal everything up and then put the sensor back in because we don't want glue going up into electronics, the sensors and stuff like that and plugging them up. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, obviously you can hit me up and I can give you whatever info you want. Um, there was a couple years ago, an article in Chief Engineer Magazine, which is a Chicago based uh, publication for all of the, you know, like the local 399 guys out there. Um, so there's an article in there about that. Um, there's articles in the ASHRAE Journal. This one's kind of old now. Um, I keep putting it in here because it's, it's a good article. Uh, and it's written by uh, Dr. Modero, the guy who uh, started up the technology for AeroSeal, although it is a, you know, 15-year-old article. Uh, and there's been other ones in the ASHRAE Journal as well. It's not like it's a one-time thing. Uh, it comes up fairly frequently. If you're thinking about doing this for your own building, you can certainly contact me and I'll get you in touch with the right folks. Um, but these are the right folks. Um, these are the three companies that are doing commercial aero seal in the Chicagoland area. Uh, there's like 30 or 40 of them doing it residentially, uh, but to do it commercially, you need more equipment. Uh, hence, it's a bigger upstart cost. You need more expertise and bigger crews. So not everybody's doing commercial. Uh, most companies are doing residential and then what I'm going to call light commercial. Like you got a small office building with a five, six ton system. Those guys would be able to do that. But you got a big building. Uh, with large systems, these are the guys you'd want to talk to. Um, Clean Air Pros is actually a relatively new company, but Joe has been doing AeroSeal, I'm going to say longer than anybody else in the state of Illinois. Um, he's been doing it for 22 years specifically. That's, what, that's all he's been doing for 22 years is AeroSeal. So he's the guy, man. He used to work over at Airway Systems. I still have them on the list. I just don't know who the champion is over there, but they're still an approved contractor. And then over at Priority Energy, Rob has also been doing AeroSeal for a long time, started out residentially as well, uh, but he also does commercial work too. I mentioned these guys by name, but they have crews that are also working with them. It's not just a one-man thing. They have teams of people that come out and do all this stuff together and, and organize your project and get it all done. So that's their info. If you want to hit them up, you're also welcome to contact AeroSeal. They're probably going to just have you work with one of these three local guys. Um, but if you had some kind of really weird special thing, uh, then that's usually when we get AeroSeal involved and they'll bring in uh, crews to their national headquarters to do the work. Um, it's obviously more expensive to do that because you bring in somebody in from Ohio um, or a bunch of guys from Ohio, but they do all like their super, super weird special lab type stuff. All right, Glenn, this is the first time in my life I've ever done a presentation and did not use my full time. I don't even know what to do with the last four minutes. I'm just going to sit here and stare at the screen, I think. That's okay. Let me see if we have any questions. I don't see any questions. Wait, what about, I got one here. What about commercial rebates? Ah, okay, fantastic. So for Peoples and North Shore Gas, as well as NICOR and ComEd, which also service this general area as well, uh, residential rebates are what I'm gonna call prescriptive. They're standard rebates, you just like a furnace or an AC or, or a small boiler. You go to the document, look at the list, see what it is, determine if you qualify, apply for your rebate. Commercially, it works differently. Uh, commercially is not prescriptive because as you saw in some of those uh, case studies I showed you, you might be saving 700 CFM or you might be saving 12,000 CFM. So commercial rebates for both the gas utilities and the electrical side of the fence uh, would go under the custom program. Glenn was talking about that a little bit earlier. Uh, for Peoples and North Shore Gas, it is 75 cents per therm saved if you have up to 7,500 therm savings. And if you save more than that, uh, you get a buck per therm saved. Um, so engineering calculations have to be done. 
Uh, the folks at Franklin Energy, which run the Peoples and North Shore Gas Program, are usually pretty good about helping you and guiding you through those calculations. Um, they are also currently working a little bit with the guys at GTI, Gas Technology Institute, um, as a priority energy, by the way, to help do some more, more improved calculations on that. But essentially, you calculate how much energy you're going to save, um, and then the utility, in this case, Peoples and North Shore, agrees or disagrees with your number and tweaks it. Uh, and then you go ahead and proceed with the project and you get a letter from from Glenn's office saying, hey, you're approved for this. Here's the anticipated savings. Right. Proceed with the work. You can double dip it, too, because there's going to be electrical savings and gas savings. So you can apply both at the gas utility and the electrical utility to get a rebate on there for the different portions of the savings, because you'll save cooling energy and fan energy. That's ComEd side of the bucket. And then you'll save gas energy. That's North Shore and people's side of the bucket. That was a good question. It's awesome. Yeah, I couldn't explain it that well. That was good. <laughs> Your the next question. What, you told me how it works. Yeah, yeah you, you know it better than I do. What date is the 2021 code enforced in Chicago again, please? All right. So City of Chicago already went live with it. It's November 1st, 2022. So that was 30 days ago. City of Chicago went live. So any project that is permitted in the City of Chicago, this is just the City of Chicago, uh, permitted after that date has to be permitted with the new IECC 2021. On top of that, starting on January 1st in the city of Chicago, there are some additional rules that kick in beyond the 2021 um, IECC. Those don't typically affect HVAC very much, so it's not a big deal for most of you guys, but just be aware of that. The state of Illinois going live with the energy code, that was supposed to be December 1st, that has gotten delayed into 2023 with no exact date. Uh, if you right. want, I, 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 one other thing I can show people that kind of relates to some of this, since I didn't use all my time for once. Um, but you can read any other questions that we have. And I'm going to pull up one other slide from something else just to kind of. Yeah, the other question is: money. Are all are all suburbs still IECC 2018? Correct. All the suburbs. And every single place in the state of Illinois, except the city of Chicago, is the 2018, 2000, uh, 2018 IECC. Um, okay, let me see this real quick here. Why is that not popping up? Okay, let me show you this one slide if I can get to it. Because there is a bunch of other free money other than the rebates that you can, that you can double tap on here. Uh, I'm on the wrong slide deck, that's why. Uh, okay, I should have put this in the slide deck, but it's, it's really new. All right, can you see my slide that says Inflation Reduction Act? Yes. Okay. So that Inflation Reduction Act, um, I'm sure you guys heard about that in August. There's a bunch of free money that is available now and even more free money available next year. So residentially, as far as duck ceiling goes, you could get up to $1,200 residentially in terms of a tax credit uh, at your house. You probably won't get that much because it's 30% up to 1200 bucks. So if you spend, let's just make um, math easy. If you spend $1,000, you can get $300. If you spend $3,000, you can get $900. Um, but you can get that money back on your residential tax credit for duck ceiling, or you can use that money to get a new AC and a furnace here. You can do it either way. It's one or the other. Commercially, which is today's discussion, um, we've had this tax credit for a while, 179D. And this is making energy efficiency improvements on your building. It's not for one specific widget. It can't be just the boiler or just the duct ceiling or just the whatever. You got to improve the whole building and you got to beat the energy standard. Um, I'm trying to remember which version of the energy standard it was. Um, you got to beat the energy stand. I'll tell you right now. Uh, you got to beat the 2007 90.1 ASHRAE. That is like the oldest thing you could possibly have to beat. It's super easy. If you bring the building up to current code today, you're already there. But instead of getting $1.80 per square foot, you can get between $2.50 and $5 per square foot for making that whole building more efficient. So it's probably not going to be just a duct ceiling job, but you might do duct ceiling along with fan energy improvement, along with a new boiler plant, right? And maybe that gets you there. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, as you're doing these projects. You can add these things together and you can get these tax credits. And you can get utility rebates. And, and for any topic, not just this, boilers, whatever, you can always double dip them. Tax credits, utility rebates come from different buckets of money, and you can get both. That looks like it. 
thanks for See, I used uh, presenting all my again. Yeah, you, you went out. Oh, well, you're right at it, right at zero. I, I'm done. You're the one going over right now. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I just got to say goodbye to everybody. Thanks again, uh, Ryan. You did a great job as usual. Um, next month, we do not have anything because it falls in Christmas. Uh, we will have the first couple weeks, we'll have our 2023 program updates. Uh, that'll be going out here. Hopefully next week or two, we'll get that out, email out to you guys. Uh, it'll also be in the BTU newsletter and also on the Trade Ally website. Uh, we do have emerging technologies on January 25th. We'll send that invite out also. And uh, thanks again for everybody attending. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me or Ryan, Ryan is at TEC. Uh, you just get a hold of me if you want, and I can forward anything to Ryan uh, if you can't get a hold of him. But he's pretty easy to find. You just Google him, and he comes up all over the place. So uh, Ryan Hoger at TEC. Uh, again, thanks for attending today, and look forward to working with you guys in the future. You have a great holiday. Thanks, Ryan. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for having me again.